This is Rob Morse of the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast. I'm reminding you that this podcast is one of the many good ones on the Self-Defense Radio Network. Check out the other podcasts at selfdefenseradio.net. Welcome to Unload and Show Clear, the podcast about all things IDPA. And now, here's your host, the only man to shoot the same non-threat four times at Nationals, Lloyd Bailey. Welcome to another episode of Unload and Show Clear, where we counter the media's negative image of gun culture by introducing you to the amazing men and women who are involved in IDPA, International Defensive Pistol Association. We're focusing on people, not politics. The everyday people from all walks of life, men and women who volunteer their time and effort, who spend their hard-earned dollars on travel, match fees, and gear to make this sport great. They're your doctors, they clean your teeth, they're fixing your houses, taking care of your pets, they fix your computers and pilot your planes, and they protect our streets and our nation. They are gun culture at its finest, and it's misunderstood or completely unknown to the mainstream media. Today, I'm going to introduce you to another one of these awesome people. But first, I want to thank today's sponsor. I found my friends Dave and Reagan Williams at Salina Gun Shop when I needed an FFL transfer for a firearm. Several years ago, they were just a tabletop FFL. Well, since that time, they have grown into a one-stop shop for guns, ammo, accessories, gunsmithing, custom engraving, and they are a certified Cerakote applicator. Whether it's a custom build, engraving, or Cerakote, no matter how mild or how wild you want your firearm, no matter what you need, they can handle it. Now, I've taken them older guns that have bad and scratched up finishes, Salina Gun Shop made them look like new. When my wife wanted her own Glock 19, I had Salina Gun Shop Cerakote the frame to just the right color that she wanted. I've had them install new sights on my guns, do repairs and trigger work on my revolvers. I trust them with my guns and you can too. I cannot recommend them highly enough. Check them out today at salinagunshop.com. That's C E L I N A gunshop.com. Look for a link in the show notes to get to their website. Or if you're here in North Texas, stop by and visit them in person at 701 North Preston Road, Suite 310 in Salina, Texas. Salinagunshop.com. Small town store, big town service. Salinagunshop.com. Our special guest today coming to us from a tree stand in Texas, from Leander, Texas. Mark Hergott, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lloyd. Appreciate it. Thanks thank, for having me. Well, thank you for being here and taking time. Uh, hope the deer doesn't show up in the middle of the show. So, <laughs> but if if he does, <laughs> no, I kind of hope it does. It, actually, it might <laughs> it might make for some interesting interesting <laughs> recordings. So, tell us a little bit about yourself, other than hunting deer. What do you do for a living there in Leander? Well, I was in the automotive industry, uh, pretty much every aspect except for sales for a long time. Decided to get out of that, and now I've been in the oil field industry for uh, about a year and a half now. So now I go out for about a month or so at a time and sit in an office 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and then get to go home for a week. (laughs) Are you originally from Texas? I am. I was uh, born at Fort Hood and uh, lived in Colleen there for a little while. And then my, after both my parents got out of the military and they got divorced, I uh, moved up to DeSoto, a southern suburb of Dallas, mm-hmm. and lived there until I went off to college. So growing up uh, a military brat on, on at uh, Fort Hood and there around the base, is that where the interest in, in guns came from? or uh, hunting is at an early age or where, where was the introduction? So oddly enough, I really didn't get into guns until, uh, after I got out of college and I, uh, moved in with one of my high school buddies who just bought a house. So when I was just moving back to Texas, so I moved in with him for a little bit and, uh, one of his other roommates It was like a four-bedroom house he bought. Uh, So one of the other roommates, uh, some of my buddies that uh, shoots occasionally, not often. So he was the introduction? 
he was the introduction. Yeah, that's how it. That's where it all started. I bought my uh, first Glock off of um, from a police officer there in Dallas, and it was just it ramped up and got out of control, <laughs> <laughs> as it usually does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then uh, about oh, I guess eight years ago, six or eight, yeah, six or eight years ago, something like that. Um, I was trying to get my parents to get their concealed handgun license, and they just kept putting it off, putting it off. So I finally went through the process of becoming a concealed handgun license instructor, CHL at the time, now it's LTC. Right. Went the process of becoming an instructor just so <laughs> I could almost <laughs> give them that extra push and be like, here, the class is free <laughs> from me. Let's just go do it. So, yeah, I spent a bunch of money to. <laughs> to you teach know, your parents, money, took a week off work so that my to get my parents to get their field handgun license. So, where did the where did the introduction, where did the interest in competitive shooting come from? That came uh, my friend that got me into guns. He had ended up moving to San Antonio, and I moved to Austin. And I was uh, looking around for things to do, and I was looking originally at uh, at Ipsic. Mm-hmm. That was back before, I guess, before USPSA and branched off of it or however they worked. But I didn't, before I knew USPSA was a thing. And once I realized there was USPSA, I was like, well, what other sports are there? So I started looking around and found IDPA and, you know, they're more derived around concealed carry and all that. Right. A lot more so then right. than now. But yeah. So I was like, oh, that'd be, that'd be fun to go shoot. And uh, so I got in with Texas Tactical. They had range. Uh, They shoot south of Austin at Austin Rifle Club and then north of San Antonio at Cedar Ridge. So I would just drive the hour and a half down to meet with my buddy and we would go to Cedar Ridge, give us something, give him a reason to, you know, dedicate some time to go shooting and we get to go have some fun. And that's actually where I met uh, Wolf, uh, Wolf Laughlin. So Iron Mike and Wolf Laughlin, uh, they're really the ones that, Push me to go further and further. So the first year or so was just me taking, you know, going to these local cl- local matches here and there. And then Wolf is actually the one who finally convinced me to start going to major matches and start spending more money. <laughs> so. so what was the first one that? Or, well, let's go back. Go back to the first your first IDPA match that you went to. What what club? Which of the clubs was it at? And what do you remember of that day? That was with uh, Texas Tactical at uh, Cedar Ridge Range. Okay. And I was using my uh, CompTech inside the waistband holster that I normally use for concealed carry. Mm -hmm. And my Glock 37 at the time that had ghost string sights, which you're not supposed to use in IDPA. (laughs) It's just, you know, what the cop had on it when he sold it to me. Right. And, um, yeah, I just bought like a cheap Blade Tech double mag pouch for the other side just wearing a regular button up t-shirt and yeah it was a lot of fun you know i wasn't very competitive at the time <laughs> you know shooting that 45 gap and you know with that pistol and all that but it was a lot of fun i probably shot that uh, for about a year what did you what did you move on to once you once you switched from the 37 and the, the 45 gap what did you what did you switch to so the first big switch I made was to HK, uh, HK P30L in uh, 40. Okay. And so I shot that for the first two or three years. And then I decided I wanted a VP9. I mean, didn't make a, they weren't making the VP40 at the time. Right. And I just came across a good deal on one at a gun show. I grabbed that and thinking, oh, I'll just grab a, I'll grab a VP40 when it comes out because I can still use all of my P30 mags with it. Mm-hmm. I had like 10 mags for that gun. <laughs> and then I never really, never really did. About, uh, <laughs> about a year or so after I did that, I was shooting it in CCP. It was right around when CCP first started. And I, once I got bumped to expert in that, I was like, well, it's time to switch to a different division. And so <laughs> uh, I always like 
guns that are really anything that most people don't have, more unique stuff. Right. So, and I've always been a big fan of Steyr. I've got World War One Steyr rifles. Nice. So when Steyr came out with their new, uh, at the time, their new L9A1 and L40A1, mm-hmm. I bought both of those. And I bounced between calibers and shooting both of those for a while. And then after Steyr picked me up on their team, uh, I guess two years ago, they've been helping me out a little bit. And then uh, now the new pistol came out, the uh, L9A2MF. And that gun, I didn't think they could improve on the trigger. It's probably one of the best out-of-the-box triggers. It's it's pretty good. So with that gun this year, since I've got it, I uh, got bumped to expert in SSB and ESP. Nice. Right before the Worlds, of course. Of course. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go uh, I'm gonna go down to go shoot this match, <laughs> get bumped to expert. I'm like, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off. I'm going to hold off in uh, SSP and save that one for the world. And then I didn't get into the worlds initially. I didn't have enough points because so many people jumped in. Right. So I was like, oh, well, I'll just uh, I'll shoot SSP at uh, at the Texas State match then since I didn't get in. Got bumped to expert there. And then, <laughs> like, the next week, Wolf calls me up and he's like, hey, you know, they're still looking for safety officers for the worlds. <laughs> <laughs> so... How long after that first sanction ma- or that first local match? How long after that before you decided to? You said it was Wolf that that encouraged you to finally get out and shoot a sanction match. How long after that first local match was that? And where was it? And what do you remember that day? It was probably about six months. Six months in. Um, no. It may have been a year. Um, yeah, no, I don't. Uh, I don't remember a whole lot about that day. I'm not even sure if it was at. <laughs> it's all a blur. Uh, if it was out at Crescent, or if it was, it was uh, before. It was probably hadn't been Texas State. Okay, it was a Tier Four match. Do you remember first impressions of your first uh, sanctioned match? Do you what do you? Do you remember anything about that day that stands out that was particularly interesting or surprising or fun? Yeah, I realized how bad I sucked. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough realization too, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> so you you now shoot for Steyr. Now, how long... Uh, you said that happened, what, a couple of years ago. So what did you do after that, that sanction match? How did you get from, um, you know, shooting 45 gap with an illegal gun, with a gun that's not IDPA legal <laughs> in your first match to, you know, expert in ESP, SSP and CCP and sponsored shooter? Uh, just a lot of shooting, a lot of shooting. I was going to the, uh, when I was competing real heavy would have been two years ago, which is when they originally picked me up mm-hmm. and I was going to the Texas tactical local matches. They do, uh, two every weekend, except for, I guess, three weekends a month. So they do six a month. Okay. And they'll do one in Austin and one in Cedar Ridge. You don't want to be Friday, want to be Saturday. Then the next week they'll switch. And so I was doing both. Oh. So I would shoot in Austin on Saturday and then drive down to San Antonio and shoot with them on Sunday. And then the next week I would drive down there Friday night and shoot Saturday, then come back up and shoot on Sunday. (laughs) Did a lot of that. Uh, Spent a bunch of money on ammo. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And then, uh, then when I decided to get out of the automotive industry, everything kind of died down. You know, that was about two or three years of shooting pretty heavy. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, then decided to get out of the automotive industry and took some pretty pretty decent sized pay cuts and took some time off work. You know, ate through my ate through my savings to take about a year off work trying to figure out what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I stumbled back uh, stumbled back into 
a good a good career that'll work well for me until I can retire. As long as uh, the oil field keeps keeps drilling, right? Just just for another five ten more years. That's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> then I can shoot even more. Exactly. So talk about how the the deal with Steyr came about. How did they? Um, how did they find, find you or did you find them? And, uh, how does that whole process work? How, how does, do they find you? Do you approach them as a little of both? What's the, what's the process there? How does that, how does that whole thing work? So the process for your, uh, you like your Wilson combat guys and stuff of that nature, they've got a much more lucrative sponsorship than I do. But how mine started is initially I contacted Steyer trying to help figure out what's going on with the extraction issues. Cause I was having a, probably three or four malfunctions during a competition. Oh. And so I was working with the armor with them and Steyer's only, there's only like six people that work at Steyer USA. It's, it's, a, it's a really small company. It may be more than six, but it's really small. And when we finally got that figured out, it, that took a while to get that figured out and take video of it and pictures and, stuff of that nature sending it in wouldn't do anything because you know he may have to fire 200 <laughs> rounds before it happens and it may happen five rounds in a row <laughs> so you help them solve the extractor issue and they said well thank you very much how would you like to be a sponsor shooter or <laughs> what happened next <laughs> now then i and then i just started asking them for support <laughs> uh and at first the support came it was pretty pretty light they just sent me uh uh, sent me a bunch of ammo and some stuff to give away and stuff of that nature. And uh, I'm thinking, wow, you know, a couple thousand rounds of ammo, that's that's worth handing out some stuff. And oh, yeah. Talk about it. So uh, that was the initial deal. And then they had somebody else in charge. And I got somebody else on the team, uh, Greg. Then he designed shirts for the team. At this time, it's really... Yeah, not really a actual sponsor team. I really haven't given us anything other than swag. Okay. And the shirts. And, you know, the ammo they gave me that one time. And then they'd also give us, um, you know, employee pricing on pretty much everything. Nice. So then they, you know, the company's real small and they don't really advertise at all. Right. And we've been pushing them and trying to get them. Hey, you've got to advertise if you're going to sell these guns. Yep. And, you know, Greg and I kept pushing them, pushing them, pushing them. And eventually they actually hired a, uh, a person for marketing that hand handles all their uh, marketing and their social media. And then they actually hired somebody that actually uh, created true sponsored teams. Of course, they have, um, just starting this year, they have a precision long range rifle team because that's really what Steyer's bigger in. Is there, mm -hmm. uh, the rifles. Uh, they have, uh, I think, one or two guys that are in three gun, and then a couple guys that are just shoot uh, USPSA, and then two guys that uh, shoot IDPA. I shoot some USPSA also whenever I can, but right. you know, mainly I shoot IDPA. Yeah, they're both fun games, but right. I prefer IDPA. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the people in IDPA too. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, I'm sure that'll probably play into the last answer, the last, the answer to the last question. So we'll get to that in just a bit. What is, talk about the, the Steyr, cause like you said, there's not a whole lot of people, there's not a whole lot of people shooting those guns. I used to, I used to shoot one a little bit. I've run into maybe three other people in, since 2012 that shoot them. Um, and I always thought they were, they were, I'm sort of like you in that I like the, the, if it's, if it's something that nobody else is shooting or not, not very many other people are shooting, I have an instant interest in it. Um, so, <laughs> because I want to be, want to be different, but, um, how do the one, one thing about the Steyr pistols that I always had trouble with and was the, the trapezoid sights. They're cool, but I never could figure them out. What's, do you like them? What do you think about them? What's the, how do you. How do you learn to shoot them? So the trapezoid, trapezoid sights were, uh, it took a little bit of a learning curve. They're actually really precise. So if you line them up and make an actual trapezoid 
you have the two sidebars mm-hmm. and you line it up uh, evenly with each side of the triangle front sight, that bullet will hit right at the tip of that triangle. Okay. So long range shots, like if we were doing, you know, the longer range head shots and stuff of that nature, I had no problem with those really precise sights. Where I had a problem was with sight acquisition, trying to get a quick sight picture. That's where I had my biggest problem with them. So I tried uh, using some sight paint, you know, painting the rear ones red and the front ones green. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't get my speed up. So I, uh, you know, I contacted Trigicon and they had no interest in making sites for it. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out if any sites would work for it. They just said no. Right. And so I did a little bit more research and True Glow makes sites for it. But all they had was, you know, your standard regular sites. Mm-hmm. And they did have the TFX, their treating fiber optic sites were just coming out. And so I contacted them and I was like, hey, are y'all going to be making these for Steyr? Because I need some for my competition guns. And they were like, oh, well, yeah, we, we might do that here at some point in time. And I was like, okay, well, I gave it a rest for a little while. And probably like four months later, the TFX Pros started coming out. Mm-hmm. I saw one at a, when Trulo was out at one of the matches. I saw the Pros. That's the U shaped rear notch and the uh, orange surround on the front dot. Mm-hmm. I was like, man, I like that. So I contacted him again and said, hey, I want some TFX Pros for my competition gun. I need these. And they kind of, you know, were messing around. Oh, we're not not sure if we're going to do this, not sure if we're going to do this. And eventually, by the fourth time I contacted them, (laughs) they sent me two sets. Oh, wow. So so they were my, uh, I don't know if you really call it true sponsorship, but, you know, they did give me those two sites. So, you know, I still give them full credit on everything. Nice. Um, So the trick, so with the, the trapezoid sites, Good for precision, not great for fast target acquisition. You're better to go to uh, a sta- like a tr- more traditional three dot arrangement. Yeah, for me, uh, for me anyway, especially with the the orange, the really bright orange front sight, mm-hmm. that really helps me a lot. Gotcha. I still have a lot of work to do on my transitions, target to target. But uh, getting that initial sight picture, that helps me out a lot. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a lot more, it's more about muscle memory. You know, once you get everything set, you have your muscle memory. You know, you could draw your gun, you can push it out with your eyes closed. You open your eyes and your sights will be lined up and on target. Right. But I'm nowhere near that level yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about. Talk about the um the match that you got bumped to expert in. Where was that, and um, what uh, what do you remember about that day? Uh, how did how did did you expect that you were going? Obvi- obviously, you didn't expect you were going to bump to to expert right before worlds. But how did it feel going through that day? Were you just you know having one of those days where everything was working? Or was it a complete surprise at the end? And you said, oh, wow, I am <laughs> I got a bump. Uh, it actually was a complete surprise. It was the first time I had shot that, the new pistol in a match. Oh. Uh, I'd only had maybe 150 rounds through it in a practice. Uh, they sent it to me, and the uh, time I got it, I didn't really have time to go practice. Then my local range back home closed, so... I didn't have any tag bays that were close by to go use. And the match was the next weekend. <laughs> so uh, my my dad's got a place in Louisiana. So I was out there and I set up a little tiny range out there. So I got a couple hundred rounds through it. And then the next weekend, I went to uh, Arkansas, fall brawl. And I remember a lot about that day because, one, it was the first match I got to shoot the new pistol. And I forgot pretty much everything at home except for my pistol. <laughs> so I drive up from Austin. I pick my dad up in Dallas. He helped me drive out there. We drive, start heading out there. I get to the Texas border. <laughs> so about five hours from my house. And my friend calls me or sends me a, a picture of 
my suitcase in the middle of the living room. Oh, okay. we, were, we were just moving in our new safe, and I got sidetracked and left my suitcase right in the middle of the living room. So it had, you know, my cover garment, my jersey, uh, my shoes, pretty much everything was in there, <laughs> except for I did have my range bag. So I had my holster, my gun, my ammo. <laughs> The really important stuff, but yeah. So by this time, it's you know nine o'clock at night, mm-hmm. and the match you know match starts at nine o'clock in the morning. So I'm trying to do a mad dash, checking all these stores, trying to find a cover garment that's long enough. Oh, so I went through, went into Academy and tried on I don't know how many long sleeve, short sleeve button up shirts, and nothing was long enough. They were all just normal shirt length, right? And I finally found a... Did you put the holster on in Academy and, or did you just eyeball it? Oh, no, I had, I had the holster on. I didn't have the gun <laughs> in the holster, but I had the holster on. So that probably, it probably got some eyes there. <laughs> so, um, I finally found the shirt that's long enough and it was an orange plaid button up dress shirt oh, God. and made out of this flannel. <laughs> it was a flannel plaid dress shirt. <laughs> ugly <laughs> and so like, whatever it's long enough so we found that uh couldn't find anything that night got up early the next morning and found that on the way to the range stopped at walmart <laughs> found it there so it's hot so i'm not wearing a long sleeve shirt right so first thing doing we get there grab my pocket knife and i chop the sleeves off <laughs> this just gets better and, and better. Yeah, oh yeah. So <laughs> I go around and meet up with Wolf and you know, and I I told Wolf about the situation as it was happening. He was giving me some ideas of where to go. And when I get there, I show up and show him what I've got. And now he calls me the lumberjack. <laughs> Cause it looks it looks like a classical lumberjack you'd see on some T V commercial. With no sleeves. <laughs> yeah, with no sleeves. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty great. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, so I was thinking that might be my new uh, my new trademark cover garment. So I, I do keep that with me now, just in case. <laughs> it's a backup. Yep. And then um, we're at the Worlds, and they had that stage with the axe. <laughs> well, that was perfect. So I didn't. So I didn't wear that for the competition. So I was staff, uh, but I did get a picture of me wearing it on that stage. <laughs> So how did the fall yeah, brawl was, go, uh, shooting wise? No, so, <laughs> the wardrobe wasn't yeah, good. <laughs> so I'm, I was all bummed out because I didn't have my gear. You know, I didn't have my shoes or anything. So I'm in my, uh, my regular boots. You know, I kind of slip around on my feet a little bit. Uh, so I really wasn't expecting a whole lot, not being in my normal gear. Figured all my muscle memory is going to be off. You know, the weight's different and all that. And you know, I, I had a few mess ups on a couple stages, but. You know, I just went into it wanting to have fun because I wasn't expecting anything uh, until the scores posted. And I was like, wait, <laughs> I actually got, I think I got second place with a bump. <laughs> and that's how that worked. I was, uh, I was very surprised. Interesting how, yeah, interesting how you go into it and you just figure, okay, this one's a wash. I'm just going to have fun and everything seems to work out. Yeah, I think you just get your head out of the game. You stop thinking about it too much. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm uh I'm really horrible at uh like target shooting. Like if I'm gonna sit there static and try to shoot at a piece of paper, mm-hmm. I'm horrible at that. <laughs> I'm probably three times more accurate behind a buzzer than I am, you know, trying to be precise. I don't know why. I think I just think about it too much. So for you Or could it just be because I hate static shooting? It could be that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, once the buzzer goes off, it's all muscle memory. And so the only thing I forget is the stage. <laughs> well, there's that. That's a problem. <laughs> in order to shoot what in. <laughs> <laughs> so how is the mental game? Is it is it uh is it still a, a challenge for you? Is it I know and nobody perfects it, but how long before you started thinking about stage planning and improving in that area? Well, probably about a year and a half, two years. When uh, after the after the first year of shooting major <laughs> matches, you know, seeing other people shoot it and 
you know, you got the guys that sit there and they walk the stage over and over and over again. I'm like, I just want to shoot. Let's go. Let's go. Right. And then you're, then you realize after a year of no progress, Hey, that I see what they're doing. (laughs) If I'm going to get better, (laughs) I'm going to actually have to think about this stuff. (laughs) But if I, if I think about it too much, right. Then I'll, then I'll totally destroy the stage. It's like, if, if I'm, I do better off as like the second shooter than mm-hmm. I do being anywhere near the end. Get a quick so get, mental walk many, through and then do it. Yeah, I'll get too many. I'll get too many different ideas of how to shoot it, and then I'll get them all mixed up. And <laughs> you know, one time I'm like, all right, I want to reload here, dump an extra round here, and then after seeing a couple of other people shoot, I'm like, well, no, maybe I'm gonna right. not dump an extra round, do a different reload here, and then I'll just mix those two plans up on the fly and <laughs> get a procedural for something. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you talked about, um, transitions earlier and we talked about the mental game. What is at this point is the strong part of your game? What is, what, what do you feel the most comfortable doing and what do you still feel like you need the most work on? Uh, following the rules and accuracy, those are probably my two, two strongest points. Uh, what I need to work on is maybe not trying to be as accurate, trying to pick my speed up a little bit. Mm. But mainly my um, transition time between targets. That's my, that's my biggest weakness. That's where I spend the most, or I should say waste the most time. (laughs) Trying to get that perfect sight picture on my first shot on the next target instead of getting it close enough. Right. So we sort of, you sort of alluded to this earlier as we sort of wind things down here. What, what is it about IDPA that you love so much? You said you've shot uh, USPSA a little bit, but this IDPA is is your preference. What is it about IDPA that you love? Why is it so uh, special to you? Uh, it's a lot of the camaraderie, you know, the people you meet. You know, everybody's attitude is just so much nicer with IDPA versus USPSA. And uh, my thing with the competitive shooting, uh, more with IDPA, it's because people aren't as aren't as strongly competitive. I, I don't really. <laughs> no good way to say that. <laughs> you know, they're they're there for to meet people and hang out versus just being there to get the best score you can. That's your only purpose of being there. To me, that takes a lot of the fun out of it. Uh, but what I really like about the shooting is it's almost like meditation to me. So for the time that the buzzer goes off, you yeah, have, or really from at, from the point of the stage walkthrough, mm-hmm. pretty much everything else in life goes away you're not thinking about anything else you're thinking about the stage what you're going to do how you're going to do it so it's it's like meditation for me block out all of the other worries in life and just focus on on that particular task for a few minutes yeah i get it yeah um mark thank you so much for doing this i can't believe you're you're sitting in a in a deer stand doing this and i (laughs) (laughs) i appreciate you taking the time and uh, I hope you I hope you tag a deer tonight. And uh, thank you so much for taking a little time to be with us. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes, sir. Hopefully sooner than later. <laughs> all right, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank our guests for coming on the show, and our sponsors for making all of this possible. Take a moment, if you would, to check out the website. Check out our show notes at unloadpodcast.com. We've got lots of interviews with more amazing guests like the one you heard today. Join our Facebook group at unloadpodcast.com slash Facebook for all the latest updates and to connect with other fans of the show. And if you'd like to support the show, we sure would appreciate it. Consider becoming a patron at unloadpodcast.com slash extra. I've got some full-length interviews and special content available there exclusively for patrons as well. And if you know somebody or you yourself would make an interesting guest for a future episode of Unload and Show Clear, please contact me at lloyd at unloadpodcast.com or click on the contact page on the website and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Tune in again next time for another episode of Unload and Show Clear. Unload and Show Clear.